Everything that you need in your notes and I'm going to provide you with all the context for the exam you're going to take on Friday. So I think a lot of information here is important. A lot of it should be review, but in case you struggled with this, I'm going to walk you through. So here we go. The importance of being earnest, Act 3, context and review. So all of this here is the material that we've covered so far, either in the first flip lesson I did for this, or in your own reading, or in the notes that I've posted to Mudge for you. All of this is designed to help you out in the process. Hopefully it works. Hopefully the audio is crisp and it doesn't fade out at any point in this lecture. So there's a recap there. You've got your characteristics of Victorianism. You have a nice solid walkthrough of Act 1 because I did provide that for you uh, earlier in the week. I posted my notes for you to review uh, as a courtesy just in case you got lost and you didn't have any real idea of where the play was going. And I left you to read Act 2 by yourself, just sort of making sure that you can put your money where your mouth is in regards to this play. So here we go. The title is the first joke. The importance of being earnest. Now, if you look at the information I provide you here on this slide, earnestness can take many forms in the play, including. So being earnest, truthful, being straightforward, Wilde pokes fun at that idea by calling it boring, solemn, pompous, even having a sense of duty. So look at how Ernest is sort of consumed by these particular characteristics. Look at how the interactions between uh, the men in Algernon's apartment Look at how in Act 2 and Act 3, the men act around Gwendolyn and Cecily, then ultimately around Miss Prism and Dr. Chausable. I think those characters are going to be significant for us as we move through and look at the development of the play. So in a perfect universe, I would have snippets written down about each character, especially how Prism is a foil, how her character acts like her name, a Prism. What does it do to the characters in the story? Just things that might be valuable for us to talk about moving forward. Now, we've talked about five significant themes or directions so far in this play. This huge concept of Victorian marriage especially marrying the right person. Is Cecily the right character for uh, you name who it was? What about Miss Prism? Is she going to be a good example? What about uh, Gwendolyn or Lady Bracknell? Each of these women represent a very specific character type. So I would have that in my notes. What are the social issues? This you've already been exposed to. What about the, con the confining nature of morality? Specifically, characters who are creating doppelgangers so they don't have to behave prim and proper in society. That split personality, if you will. Dorian Gray sort of has this persona, as we've seen also in Maybe a tale of two cities, but again, some specificity here. My fourth point is that idea that there's a good clash in this play between hypocrisy and inventiveness. Are characters being dishonest or are they reinventing who they are against the confines of Victorian society? So I see a really good connection between 
number four over there also in number one. Maybe something that you want to jot down in your notes in case I put it in an essay question for you to review. You also have the importance of not being earnest. How we ultimately challenge Victorian values and Victorian norms by not upholding the moral standard. By refusing to behave in a prim and proper way. I had met with one of your peers this morning to talk about his research paper, and this is exactly what we talk about. The irony between what you're expected to be and what you want to be. I also made the point in that meeting that this is very much the conflict between the emotional parts of ourselves where we don't want to be earnest and well-behaved in any of that with the irony of we have certain expectations we have to follow in proper society. So I would make sure I would have something along these lines in my notes so that I could reflect on it. Now, here we go. Focused reading of Act 3. So in your notes, separate section, I have a separate page in my uh, legal pad that I'm working on. So the original title of Wilde's play is a pun. A pun is a humorous play on words. So it's a joke between homophones. Of course, you know homophone is uh, or are two words that sound the same, but the spelling difference is significant. So I spelled this out for you here. Earnest, traditional spelling of a person's name. Earnest, seriousness, and honestness. That play on words forms the conflict of this play by Oscar Wilde. So if you look at what it says at the bottom, so the contrast in his work is the fact that even when both declare to be earnest, no one is really honest with his lover. I think when you get into Act 3, where everybody changes names and takes on different identities, they get what they want. It really plays on this act, uh, this idea of the pun. I was going to say the Act 3 pun. But certainly, it makes sense. So here's where I'm going to transition from slides over to my bright, shiny face as we begin week four of quarantine. So make sure that you are right now pausing if you need to to get your notes out so that you can flesh these materials out. Of course, I've been asking you to send me copies of your notes, so now you can just fill in the gaps. So, let us delve into the specific detail of Act 3, so that you and I can be on the exact same page of what's occurring here socially, all of this. So, immediately, and I find this very significant, we open with Gwendolyn, and she gives us social awareness, social criticism immediately. Her first line, and here's my text so I can read it to you directly. Because Jack and Ernest aren't playing by the social rules, she says, the fact that they did not follow us at once into the house, as anyone else would have done, seems to me to show that they have some sense of shame left. I think this is a gigantic reveal uh, where our female characters are going to be much stronger than we had them before. I think this is a huge part of Wilde's criticism. Gwendolyn is going to manipulate this situation, not Algernon or Jack manipulating the situation, but instead it's going to be the women. I think this allows us to look forward to the character of Miss Prism and the role that she's going to play and sort of the word I want to use, I'm going to refrain from, uh, manipulating Dr. Chausable later on in Act 3. So I look at that first line by Gwendolyn. Women are dominant, uh, manipulative, certainly here in the beginning of Act 3. 
certainly defined in challenging the social rules of Victorianism. This is where you would go back to that first lecture on this play and look at your characteristics of Victorian literature as I provided, provided them to you in the PowerPoint. Certainly going to be uh, valuable. I also look at the lines and, and Gwendolyn says to Cecily, they don't seem to notice us at all. Couldn't you cough? Both of the women are watching Ernest and Algernon, but they're not behaving in a way. The men are to satisfy the expectations of these women. So this idea that there's little, this little side cough, this little, oh, look, let me just draw attention to us. So Gwendolyn goes out of her way to attract the attention of the men. But a few lines later, she says, I'm going to be a bit dramatic here. She's going to go, oh, my God, they're looking at us. What effrontery. How horrible that these boys would steal a glance at us women, even though a couple of lines earlier, she said, God, I really wish they'd pay attention to us. Wilde is pointing or painting Gwendolyn as coy, C-O-Y, as being flirtatious, as being sort of playing hard to get. I look at this and say high social expectations. I look at this and go, this is really challenging the Victorian social norms of what prim and proper behavior are. Gwendolyn is not prim and proper. Cecily is not going to be prim and proper in her behavior. So this contrast, this lack of being earnest is significant. I wrote down after those quotes, women vowed to play coy. And when Ernest and Algernon don't play by their game, they give them the silent treatment. Interesting social behavior. How do you get your significant other to do what you want? You play the silent treatment. But I also find it ironic that Gwen can't control herself. She so wants to get involved, she can't control her emotions, so the silent, the silent treatment doesn't work so well for her. She corners Ernest and she says, much depends on your reply. Much depends on how you respond to what it is that I'm doing. I'm testing you to see where you are with your social behavior. Gwendolyn is providing specific Victorian social cues. Victorian social cues to grab the attention of Ernest and Algernon. But they're not playing the game the way that Gwendolyn wants them to. So now I look at the sort of pairing of Cecily and Gwen. There's very much a, an idea here that one represents common sense. The other one represents uncontrolled, like I got to act on what I feel. Again, we've seen that conflict of logic versus emotion before. So this idea of common sense, but immediately, even Cecily turns aggressive. All of this is going to be on page 43 of your play, right there uh, at the beginning. We see, pardon me, we see this huge development of character behavior. So we know that Gwen wants to know why Ernest lies about Jack, but she can't hold on to that anger very long because she's flattered that they make it all about her. So the development of the attractive, needy, sort of um, self-centered Victorian woman, I think, becomes really, really something that stands out at the beginning of Act 3. Can we compare that idea of the selfish, 
self-absorbed, egotistical, I use six different adjectives here, uh, woman to larger ideas. What's Wilde saying about them in the play? Gwen scolds Ernest, but then turns to Cecily and talks about what fun they're having messing with the boys. So, Gwen, Gwen has got some bigger character. I wrote that she really knows how to play this social game. She's very good at manipulating the boys to get what she wants, certainly out of the process. Because then, almost two lines later, she says, should we forgive them for their bad behavior? And because they're best friends and all of that, they go, couldn't we speak at the same time so that they share this idea of social expectations and social significance. I think really, really important there uh, is how Wilde develops Gwendolyn specifically and Cecily sort of as a uh, addendum, if you will, to what he's doing with the development of the female character. So certainly, in this walk, she really drew pages 43, 44, and really onto 45. This allows us to see what's important here in these ideas. So let us, for the sake of moving on with the uh, presentation, go back to where we were just a moment ago. The idea here is that these are notes that are significant for what occurs in Act 3 and why it is significant to Victorianism. So this slide provides you with every bit of information that you're going to need to label and structure everything. So if I start on the upper left, it talks about the basic structure, the order, chaos, order. Everything starts appropriately. Chaos is caused by romance and love and feeling. And at the end of the play, everything returns to a sense of order and Victorianism and society are preserved and everybody lives happily ever after. But that occurs because of the comedy of manners, which is two to the right. The comedy of manners is it's funny because characters overdo their behavior. Characters overdo uh, their adherence to social rules and guidelines. I think this is why we create the doppelganger, why we have the Jack and the Bunbury. And we have this huge mistaken identity in Act 3 because if people are acting like they're somebody else, they're not responsible for their moral behavior. So I think very much that's why the idea of the comedy of manners matters. If I skip down to again to the conventions of romantic comedy, we've all seen romantic movies. We've all seen these sappy, overly, the word I want to use is this overly gooey, it's sticky, it's so sweet, it's wonderful. We're all familiar with characters riding off into the sunset. Boy meets girl. Girl despises boy because he doesn't pay enough attention to her. Girl falls madly in love at the end of Act 3, and the whole universe is made correct. Certainly elements of romantic comedy. And I think those ideas of romantic comedy are reflected in the happy ending, and the idea of comic timings, and the idea that everything gets resolved, but there's still some disorder. I think that's incredibly important for us to look at, as we're walking through the development of the play. It works especially because of the earnestness of Victorian society and how it impels 
Algernon and Jack to invent fictitious characters. This is that doppelganger. And they do it, and I even put it in red for you. They create these characters to escape the restrictions of decorum and decency that Victorian society puts on people. And I find it interesting that in the beginning, the expectation is that the boys are perfectly fine and that it's the girls that are bad. But we flip that on its ear in Act 3. The girls certainly have control of the situation and the boys are certainly made to be the whim or manipulated by the girls. As you read the play, ask yourself who, if anyone, is really truthful. Are people being honest or is there an implication that in order to be a normal member of society, you have to be able to break the rules. That being earnest isn't the appropriate standard. This is an interesting idea for where you might want to go on this for your test on Friday. Just saying, it might be an interesting way for me to kind of put all these concepts together. As I'm going through my notes, I'm thinking about where I want your Act 3 material to go. Uh, I found the discussion in Act 3 about Christian names and who needs to be baptized and who needs to be respectful and who are we killing off and what are we doing here with specific characters. The Christian names and how they look at it and go, it would be a terrible ordeal to go through the process to become good, to become appropriate, to become respectable. We're completely content when we're breaking the rules and we haven't been recognized. But this idea of going through the process to become respectable, to have a good name and a good background so that I can fit into society, I find that very interesting as an idea. The girls want the boys to get christened for the down because it's more appropriate and it fits the social rules much better. That way they can be the knights in shining armor. But clearly from all of this, the women want the boys to change who they are so they can fit more appropriately into the respectable society of the time. Clearly for me, I think that to be a Victorian idea. You have to be respectable. You have to do all these appropriate things. An irony I found in this is that we're talking about the equality of the sexes. Men are infinitely beyond us. I believe Gwendolyn says that uh, near the beginning of Act 3. That the men are infinitely beyond us. So let's level the playing field. As soon as she says that, they fall instantly in love. And that's certainly on the bottom of page 44. So if you're looking for a major way to find this in your notes, go to the bottom of page 44 and look at this. We criticize, but then we still fall madly in love. We start logical, but then we sort of fall into the easy, more fun idea of romance. Also in my notes, I talk about how this is where Lady Bracknell comes back in. Uh, so while it was about romance for a moment, as soon as she comes in, it's now all about social class. Lady Bracknell represents the idea of social class and specifically what the rules are. So she's the alpha and you've got Gwendolyn and Cecily trying to figure out where they're going to fit in and how they're going to blend who they want to be with what the social rules are. But then you have Lady Bracknell back up here who absolutely says this is the way that you have to be. So go to page 45 in the play and look at the quotes there about Lady Bracknell and the kinds of things that she says. So I think that's incredibly significant. 
I also look at what Lady Bracknell says when she learns of Bunbury's death. Of course, Bunbury's death is completely fabricated and superficial, but when she learns of it, she says that he is the victim of revolutionary outrage. He can't just be gone. She has to be overly dramatic and connect him to these violent social changes that are occurring in society. It's a subtle little point, but it certainly stands out. The Victorians don't like change. The Victorians don't want criticism of the status quo and the way that they go through their material. Certainly a valuable point for us to notice as we're going through the text. I move on a little bit and I go to page 46 where Lady Bracknell the reaction to the announcement of the engagement. Yeah, see, this is huge. And the fact that Lady Bracknell is completely disapproving of social marriage. Let me rephrase that. She only approves of social marriage and not marriage for romance. So all of this Gwendolyn, Cecily, Ernest, Algernon marrying because of what they feel, not going to work. That's why she is so socially disapproving. It's funny. Because as soon as uh, Lady Bracknell learns where he lives, she changes her tongue. Oh, he's great. Now that I know where he's from. As long as the character has that connection to background and lineage and all those kinds of things that are important, they become socially acceptable. And we know this absolutely to be true. You hear about people from certain places, and then that has a huge impact on what we see in their behaviors. It's in this part of the play where Jack can prove his lineage. We know about the... Um, Sir Thomas Cardew, we know the information from Act 1. But Jack comes along, he says, look, I've got a letter from Mark B, Mark B, Mark B, Mark B, and Mark B three times. He names the names. We call this name dropping. It's where you come from. It's who you're connected to. And as Lady Bracknell hears this, she again flies off the handle and says, wow, this is amazing. You must know some important people. You must come from the right area of the city. Oh my God, you must live in the right suburb and not downtown. Oh my God, who, who could even imagine? And we know that these social stereotypes exist. So certainly plays a significant part. Page 47, I think the whole play changes. <coughs> Pardon me. I think the whole play changes when Jack says, I am worth 130,000 pounds. Ton of money. So as soon as Jack says, I got money to my name, Lady Bracknell is like, oh, honey, thank you for being in the family. Oh, I can't believe that I gave you such a hard time and that, that sticky that, that lie-to-your-face, snobby, nose-in-the-air kind of, kind of condescending thing now becomes important. And I even find that going further on page 47. When he mentions his worth, he also says it's in the funds. It's in the market. It's protected. Yes, there's been some speculation, but... I am a man of value. And as I said, Lady Bracknell at this point, she's all in. This is where she becomes comfortable, almost enthusiastic about the idea of marriage. Hugely ironic what Wilde is doing here. Pointing out that when you marry for money, when it's an appropriate match, not for love, not for emotion, but for the idea that it's about feeling. I'm sorry, not about feeling. It's about tangible assets. Completely changes the focus of the play. 
Now, 48 forward, look at how these ideas ironically get developed. I would look specifically at PRISM and Dr. Chausable as really explaining the significance of what Wilde's doing here with these social pairings, if you will. So, Jack, Algernon, Gwendolyn, Cecily, how is that all put into perspective by what we learned from Prism and Chausable? Very significant. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop my presentation and leave page 48 forward for you in your notes and your development in advance of Friday's test. So make sure that you go through and you do your reading, you review these notes. Now, I've given you context. I gave you an entire lecture on Act 1. I gave you copies of my annotations in the text so that you would be able to go through and do some of that copying. My hope is, is that you've done those things and you've pieced the materials together since this is how we have to run class and its functionality.